Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Critical Theory. It's a podcast that's part of the New Books Network. On this episode, I'm talking to Stuart Eldon about the early Foucault. Uh, So welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, So this is the third book uh, in a series of four books uh, about Foucault. Um, And it's, I I guess, (laughs) this is a strange word for it, but it's almost a kind of prequel to uh, the other two books you've already done. And it prefigures um, a a new book that is hopefully going to be published last year. And I wonder to kind of set the scene, could you say a little bit about uh, the series of books and, and perhaps the kind of the choice of writing order for them? Okay, thank you. I, I didn't set out when I started work on Foucault's last decade to think that I was going to write anything of this scope. And in the writing of Foucault's last decade, which we've discussed before, that grew and I decided that there was a book that looked at the immediately preceding period, so how Foucault came to write Discipline and Punish. And then I thought, well, if I've done that, which which broadly looks at sort of 1969 to 1984 when Foucault dies, maybe it would be interesting to write a book that goes in front of those to to cover the earlier part of Foucault's career. And when I decided that that was what I was going to do in discussion with friends, in discussion with with Policy Press, I decided actually there needed to be two books to, to treat that earlier part of Foucault's career. And so... I wrote this book, The Early Foucault, which looks at Foucault's time from a student in the mid-1940s through to the publication of The History of Madness in 1961. I always knew that there was going to be a book on on roughly 1962 to 1969 to follow it. And the reason I've written the books in this way is partly because of the availability of material. Um, I think we we should try and talk a bit about the archives, which have made a book like this possible. But these have been opened up over the last few years. And, and when I began work on Foucault's last decade in, in around 2012, 2013, the archival material was simply not available for the earliest period of Foucault's career. So that's part of the reason. It was that it was a project that grew and that forced me to keep going backwards. And as the archives have opened up, it's allowed a, a, a more rich treatment of this, this period. I mean, it's worth saying that it's it's very much a, a sort of an intellectual biography in, in the sense of you've been looking for um, both the development of, of his thoughts, but also it, almost his kind of craft um, as, as a thinker, as, as an academic, as a, as, as a scholar, rather than, you know, the kind of traditional bi- biographical uh, details, which you mentioned in the book are covered by a couple of other texts. You'd also flagged there, you know, this question of, of how you go about um, doing this kind of, of project. And I, I'm very interested to know more about that kind of how question, like where did you find the material? How did you select the material? You know, what, what kind of things did you think were sort of significant when you were doing archival research? What kind of things, you know, um, were you able to sort of just say, well, that probably isn't relevant? Or is it a case of be, because this material was relatively only recently available, you were able to kind of draw everything together for the book? Well, I think when I started, um, I wasn't sure that there was enough material to write a book on on broadly the 1950s, so from the late 1940s to the early 1960s, but it's really the 1950s that's, that's the focus of this book. And Foucault publishes very little in that decade. Um, he has long periods where he doesn't seem to be publishing at all, or at least there are some publications that come out, but they were almost certainly written a couple of years before. And then suddenly the history of madness comes out in 1961. And it sort of seems like it's come from, not quite from nowhere, but that there seems to be quite a clear break between that and the the earlier work that Foucault had done. And so I was interested in, in both some of the things that Foucault did do in the 1950s, some of which he published, many of which he, he chose not to publish, and then how Foucault came to write the history of madness. And it was a a project that grew as more material became available or I realised that it was worth looking in other people's archives for traces and connections to Foucault and so on. And so it it began with not knowing that there was going to be enough material and ended with, wow, there's so much material, it's going to be impossible to manage to keep this within the confines of a single book. And as is fairly common for me, I I really pushed the word limit um, with the text. I mean, I feel that it's quite a... 
distilled terse text in places, but part of that was simply trying to keep it to a reasonable length and, and something that would be published at, at, in a single volume and so on. So I tried to be pretty exhaustive in going through what, what material there was. Sometimes, you know, I could spend days in the archive going through things and thinking, actually, there's nothing really in this that, that is going to f- filter through into the book. But I only know that because I've gone through everything that's in that box or the selection of folders and so on. So the the Bibliothèque Nationale in France has got the, the main archives of Foucault's work. It's got all of the papers that were in his uh, apartment when he died. These were sold in 2013 by Foucault's partner, Daniel de Fer. But what's become available only in the last few years is a collection of papers that Foucault's nephew found in Foucault's mother's house. And these look like things that Foucault left there probably when he moved to Uppsala in 1955. And it, it, it's his um, notes from when he was a student. It's drafts and materials relating to his very earliest publications and a whole range of other things. And it looks to me like Foucault left it and didn't ever look back at it again. He, he never returned to this. He didn't keep copies of some of the things that are in there in his own papers in his apartment in Paris. So going through all of the boxes of that um, and just finding what bits and pieces there were there. that It's not a properly catalogued uh, collection yet. So it really was just a sort of trial and error. of you just, it, Each morning I'd turn up and I'd start on a new box or and work my way through it and find out what there was that was interesting and then go back to a few things later when I because sometimes you read something and think this this isn't particularly important or interesting then you know weeks or months down the line you might read something else and think okay I can see a connection so I'd go back to something and look at it again so it was a fairly exhaustive process of going through things um, guided in part by clues that other people had given biographies Foucault and and so on but a lot of it was just a, a methodical going through everything that there is and seeing how it could be put into a coherent story. I suppose that coherent story starts really with, with his, his first um, attempts to um, develop a, a, an academic or, or kind of intellectual position. And I was fascinated by um, a, a, a series of things, not just that I didn't know, but, you, you know, uh, a series of struggles he, he had um, both in, in terms of um, his disciplinary interests. So he trains in philosophy and, and, and psychology um, and you can see, you know, this comes up obviously repeatedly later in his career, but also he fails one of the kind of key exams in the French um, system um, and also draws on subjects like um, sexuality um, when he, he redoes um, this, this exam. And I'm fascinated to know a bit more about both those kind of early years, but also, I guess, the kind of the key influences around in those early years as well. Okay, so he, he begins his studies in Paris after the Second World War and is taught by an, a number of figures who are very famous in their own right. So people like Jean Hippolyte, who's a France's leading Hegel scholar of that period, um, Jean Val, who's an important historian of philosophy, um, Louis Althusser was teaching Foucault in this period, and um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. These were all people that Foucault was taught by in, in the late 40s and through into the early 1950s, um, all important in different ways and, and not necessarily in the ways that you might expect. So at the time, for example, Merleau-Ponty was mainly teaching child psychology rather than the, the philosophy work that he's best known for. Althusser is important. Um, Althusser at this point has published very little but he was extremely important to students at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, the ANS, in Paris, because he was preparing them, as you said, for this, this competitive teaching examination, the aggregation. And Althusser would do these very intensive um, preparatory classes for the students that would, would have to take this, that they would have to write texts to pass this examination, but there were oral, also an oral component where the students would be given a topic, they'd be given two or three hours in the library to prepare and then they would have to deliver a lecture in front of a jury of examiners and this was to prepare students for being able to do this in the classroom. Foucault um, goes through this intense preparation for this with Althusser and Althusser kept all of his notes on the students that he taught for this which was a, a really interesting resource where he would give them a mark out of 20 and give them some kind of feedback around what they'd done well what they'd done less well and so on. 
And I think in a sense, part of Foucault's reason for failing the first time was a sort of a hubris. He was trying, his examiners said, to be be almost too clever to, to display his range of knowledge and, and, and things that he was interested in in answer to a question, but not necessarily mention the, the more sort of um, traditional things that you might expect a student to, to hear if they were going to get, get a lecture on a particular topic. So Foucault goes through this pretty intense training um, kind of regime. And it sounds, I mean, the ANS at this time was, was single sex. It sounds like it was a pretty intense kind of intellectual environment, an intensely competitive one as well. So, yeah, taught by a range of people, um, as you said, both philosophy and psychology. And Foucault also did some psychology classes at the, the French Institute of Psychology in Paris. And so it was a broad education in both philosophy, which was what he, he formally qualified in. But then, and later on in the book, I talk a bit about this, his teaching, his first few teaching jobs um, through into the 1960s, his teaching jobs were to teach psychology to philosophy students. So that even though philosophy was the thing that he perhaps wanted to be teaching, he was actually having to teach uh, psychology uh, b- because of the nature of the jobs that he had. And, and he was writing in, in this space as, as well. And um, I'll probably mispronounce this, but uh, Malady Mentale Personalite yeah. um, is, is, is the book of, of this period, which uh, I suppose there are two stories about this book. One is the writing of this book in its first instance, and then, you know, kind of later on, um, almost the kind of like redacting or, you know, at least um, I guess a kind of an ambivalent attitude towards it um, and the the way that it it ends up not being one of those kind of, you know, canonical texts that we we might associate with Foucault. And I I think this is a a quite nice example, actually, both if we could talk about it for a little bit, Mm. both of what he was doing uh, in his early years, but also maybe some of the ambivalences he had towards that, that work in the early years too. Right. So, so, I mean, he was commissioned to do this book. It was actually Althusser that had mediated the commission. Um, It was Jean Lacroix, the Catholic philosopher who commissioned Foucault, but Althusser, I think, had introduced Foucault to him. And this was a short introductory series, uh, uh, Initiation into Philosophy was the title of the series. And Foucault was commissioned to write the book on, on psychology for that series. So a sort of psychology guide, but for philosophers. And at this time, psychology was predominantly taught within philosophy departments. And and this is a commission. This is before Foucault has a doctoral thesis. It's when he's beginning his teaching career. And as I said, he's teaching psychology. And uh, Foucault later in his life calls this kind of, you know, these were kind of basic bread and butter type works that he was doing at this point, all commissioned, all written for a a particular purpose. and, And in this case, for a student audience. And it's a book that doesn't seem to have got a great deal of attention at the time it was published in in 1954 um and then as you said there's a later version of this text which comes in comes out in 1962 which is after Foucault has submitted and defended the history of madness as a as a thesis and that book has been published and it's got quite a lot of attention and the publisher of this early 1954 book seems to think oh this is a good time to do a re-edition of the text and Foucault tried to prevent it being republished but the contract didn't allow him to do that and so what this meant was that he decided okay what I need to do then is is to rework this book to try to make it into something that's a little bit less um less of a contrast to the position that he's now staking out in terms of a more mature work in in the history of madness so he drops one chapter he writes an entirely new chapter, which is basically a historical survey drawing on the history of madness and makes changes elsewhere in the book. Um, but I mean, Didier Erebon, Foucault's biographer, calls this book Mbata, like a mongrel or a bastard book, this 62 version. It's a mess. It's a kind of hybrid, a Frankenstein monster kind of type book because it's got a bit from 54 with some small changes and a bit from the early 60s, which is Foucault at that point, that has sort of tried to stitch together. And Foucault does manage to prevent this book from continuing to be re-edited in France in his lifetime. There's another edition in 1966, which is just a reprint edition. Then it goes out of print and it's only republished in French after, after Foucault's death. So it's a strange book, but having these two editions of the text, and it's only the 1962 one, which exists in an English translation, 
it is, and, and other people before me have noticed this, it's an interesting book for comparing where Foucault was in the early to mid 50s and the early 1960s and seeing, in a sense, the distance he's travelled between those two uh, moments. He's also doing what I guess we call kind of practical work. Uh, he's, he's working in a hospital during this period. And, and I was struck, I think it's right at the very end of the second chapter, um, there's a very brief uh, kind of comment about um, essentially why he doesn't become a psychiatrist. And, and you can see in this period the kind of possible career uh, that might have been mapped out for him um, in, in psychiatry or, or in a more kind of applied setting. And I was very struck by that, partially because it's an extremely sort of poignant, uh, very human story about his you know, sort of interactions with uh, with patients um, in a hospital he was working in. But also, it, it, I think it does give us a clue about where he would end up and, and some of his, you know, I, I guess, kind of take on things like psychiatry and um, hospitals and, and institutions. So, yeah, why did he not decide? Uh, why did he not become a psychiatrist? No, that's interesting. Yes, he was working at the saint anne Hospital in Paris and also working at a sort of an evaluation centre for prisoners um, in Fresne, outside of Paris. And he's working in these places because Jacqueline Verdot, who was a family friend, and she's important in the Foucault story because she commissions Foucault to, to work with her on the Ludwig Binswanger translation, Dream and Existence, which is a, an important early publication for Foucault because Foucault writes this introduction to the text that's, that's actually longer than the text that, that, that's been translated. But the Verdot was working as a um, practising a psychiatric kind of um, assessor in in hospitals and in in prisons, and asks Foucault to to be involved. and And Foucault seems to have done some sort of fairly mundane work in terms of of um, helping them with various experiments that they were doing about, uh, particularly around visual perception. And Foucault seems to have been interested in this partly because it was giving him an experience of of what institutional psychology was or institutional psychiatry in a sense of the kind of evaluation of people was actually doing but equally he feels that he's in this kind of strange position he feel, you know he's not really an employee and he's certainly not a patient uh, but he feels that he's in this slightly kind of um position in the middle and talking to some of the the, the people that were being evaluated that were either um uh, in the hospital or, or uh, incarcerated and going through these psychiatric tests um, before the, the transfer to a different prison, regional prison, for example. Foucault seems to have kind of become very disillusioned with what the institutional forms was doing. And, and you can see a lineage from this. The Foucault then goes on and writes about asylums, about hospitals and about prisons in later parts of his career. And he, he's got experience of actually seeing these institutions from the inside, from working with people so he had a training that would have allowed him to do more of that work but all the time that he is doing that very practical work he's also teaching he's also uh, writing and so he's kind of combining these different things at the same time so he's teaching both in Paris at the ANS Althusser had had, uh, commissioned him to teach there as soon as Foucault passed the aggregation Foucault was moved from being a student one day almost to, to teaching the next day, which was the same path that Althusser had taken, that they would often, at the NS, hire the best student who just passed to prepare the next cohort of students to go through the the, the process. So Foucault's teaching there. He's also teaching in Lille, uh, and he's commuting from Paris to Lille um, to do classes there. So Foucault's doing a lot of different things. And as I said, he's also doing some of these writing projects. So in a sense, it got to a point where he had to make a choice about which of these he might pursue. And the Uppsala job is the thing that, in a sense, rescues him from this this trying to do too many things at once. Um, and he moves to Uppsala in 1955. And that's, a, an, a, I think, a really important stage or kind of even a break in the Foucault story, that he puts a lot of stuff behind him in 55 and starts not quite a new, but starts with with a new focus or with some some new interests um, in Sweden. The, the Uppsala period, but but also he, he goes to Warsaw as, as well. Um, I, I was I was kind of struck, um, and the book makes it clear how kind of crucial this period was uh, in terms of the development of the history of Madness project and the history of Madness book, but but also at the same time 
he's and you know it'd, it'd be interesting to, to hear your your sort of take on this i, I kind of got the sense that like he was there as an intellectual but you know these weren't kind of like classic sort of teaching university positions these are you know much more kind of cultural roles that he's doing um certainly in warsaw it sounds as if he had a really bad time <laughs> in terms of you know things like the accommodation being quite grim and you know the kind of context um of um particularly the kind of regime there at, at the time um and this is a moment where I, I was struck by you know really the kind of in, intersection of the i suppose difference of um these two places and from what he was doing in in france and i guess the kind of the atmosphere in france as well you know you described the kind of atmosphere at uh, ens is you know highly competitive and um you know almost quite quite closed so w- what was the kind of the Uppsala and, and, and Warsaw periods like for him and, 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 you know, why were they so important to help understand uh, the history of madness project? So the, the Uppsala period, he's in Uppsala for three years and they are really important years um, for the history of madness, particularly he, he goes to Uppsala um, on the recommendation of George de Mazil. De Mazil is a historian of, of mythology and of, um, philology who had had a post in in uh, Uppsala 20 years before and Dumazil had been asked for a recommendation for somebody to take this post and through a, a mutual contact contacts Foucault and says you know this is this is one of the top jobs he says and and I think you'll find this interesting and what Foucault does in Uppsala is to teach um, French literature at the university but also to run the cultural program at the the local French Institute and Foucault puts on plays or there's film screenings or there's book discussions or they'll listen to a a, a gramophone record, Um, various things that Foucault does and gives public lectures as well around some of the things that he's interested in. And Foucault spends these three years in Uppsala, although it it seems that as soon as the teaching term finished, he would would get in his car and he would drive back to Paris. That that seemed like a a fairly kind of um, clear sense that he was in Uppsala when he had to be in Uppsala. But he was in Uppsala for some of the, the long um, Swedish nights, as he described them. And he said, this is where I got this. He calls it a filthy mania for writing six hours a day or whatever it was that, that he would just keep writing and writing. There was a there's a fantastic library in Uppsala uh, called the Carolina Redaviva Library. And they had a collection in the history of medicine that Foucault used. I mean, he didn't use it maybe as much as is sometimes reported, but he certainly wrote a lot of the history of madness while he was in Uppsala, various drafts of the text and so on. And he's also putting on these cultural events. He's giving quite popular lecture courses. There's one on uh, the concept of of love in in French literature from the Marquis de Sade to Jean Genet, which must have been quite a thing for the locals of Uppsala to have experienced Foucault teaching. Unfortunately, there's almost no materials from his teaching in this period that still exist. Whether he didn't use notes or whether he didn't keep notes, it's not not clear, but there's very little relating to his teaching from the time that he was in Uppsala, unfortunately, in the archives. But I, I mean, I went back through old Swedish newspapers to piece together the titles of all of the public lectures that he gave in Stockholm in the time that he was there. And so on. So it was it was an important time. I mean, Dumazil is an important intellectual figure for Foucault, but he also gets him this this job on his recommendation. Foucault discovers this history of medicine collection and starts working on it very intensely. And because he's fairly isolated in Uppsala, um, seems to have got into this habit of of working and writing and rewriting. And, and the, the history of madness, he has a contract to write this with, with Jacqueline Verdot before he leaves with a press called La Table Ronde, which he never fulfills. But it seems to have been the kind of the germ, the seed of what becomes the, the massive book of the history of madness that's published a few years later. He leaves Uppsala in in um, 58. Um, Part of the reason seems to have been that his teaching load was going to be doubled and he, he, that, that was going to be the thing that, that drew an end to that part of his career. He, again, wants one of these cultural postings that's attached to a lecturing position, but also has this, this cultural role. And up, um, Warsaw is the place that he ends up. But when he arrives, he's pretty shocked at what he finds there. He writes back letters, actually some of these to, to Dumazil, talking about just 
how awful everything is there. I mean, this is only 13 years after the end of the war. Um, and of course, Poland had been invaded you know, at the beginning of the war and then supposedly liberated by the Soviet Union. Um, and this was a transitional time in Poland and a lot of Warsaw had not been rebuilt after the, the, the bombing and so on. So it was a pretty difficult time for him there. And there's a, there's a scandal uh, that ends his time there quite quickly. And then he moves on to Hamburg, which seems to have been a place that he had a much um, much happier time in Hamburg for a year. So these three posts, the, the longest one was in Uppsala and then shorter ones in Warsaw and in Hamburg, where he's teaching French literature, he's running cultural programs in all of these places, but he's also writing and, and preparing the work that becomes his two theses. I mean, the, the two theses thing is, is still... A sort of remarkable achievement, isn't it? On on the one hand, you have you know what would become um, the history of madness as you know this you know really long like tome um, when when it was pub- was it, it was published in English properly sort of maybe a decade ago something yeah, like it was that. Two thousand five, the full English version. Oh, that like time really <laughs> does get away from you. It's incredible. Two thousand five. Um, but also he, he writes a thesis about Kant, uh, which is also, um, if I'm correct, a, a sort of a translation as, as well. Um, and I was particularly taken by that because, you know, to an extent, this is another one of those, I suppose, moments in the early Foucault where you see both the kind of breadth of, of his interests, the breadth of his abilities, but also, you know, a, a sort of a set of interests that maybe um, were not as prominent in, in, in some of the work later. And it'd be interesting to hear a bit about that secondary thesis on, on Kant and where it kind of fits in with, with his work at, at this time. Right. So, I mean, this was a standard thing if you were doing the, the doctorate in letters in, in France at this time, that you had to present a, a secondary or a minor thesis alongside your primary thesis. So the history of madness, as extensive as it was, was only part of what he needed to do for this. So, I mean, it, it is a much more demanding qualification than a modern PhD. Um, it's more like a kind of German habilitation thrift kind of type level of qualification that, that Foucault was getting. And so, yes, he translates Immanuel Kant's anthropology from a pragmatic point of view from German into French. And he writes a long introduction to that text that shows that he he has got a, a pretty good knowledge of Kant's work as a whole, rather than just this this text on the anthropology, and publishes the translation of the anthropology in 1964, uh, but only then with a very short introduction, um, just a few pages, a kind of a historical note to contextualise the text, and he leaves the the entire introductory text in. The archive, it's it's there in the, the Sorbonne archive where Foucault had defended his thesis, and it has been published and translated um, long after Foucault's death. But it's a an interesting text. I mean, so so Foucault's sponsor for the history of madness was Georges Congrien, the, the historian of a historian of philosopher of science. The sponsor, the, the rapporteur of the secondary thesis was Jean Hippolyte, the, the Hegel scholar. And there's a, a certainly a mark of Hippolyte's work in what Foucault does, Hippolyte's famous uh, commentary on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is called the genesis and structure of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. And the the genesis and the structure of Kant's anthropology is is close to what Foucault is doing in this text. He does that work in Hamburg, which makes sense, it seems. It sounds that he had had some help with the the translation. Foucault had translated things from German before this, but had some help with some of the technical aspects of the translation. There's some correspondence with with Hippolyte where he's talking about how this work is progressing and what he's able to send him and so on. And then it's these two theses together that he defends in in May 1961 to get the the doctoral. Um, And Foucault is in his mid-30s at this point, so he's a bit older than perhaps people would be today if they were getting a PhD. I mean, it's a much more substantial kind of intellectual process that he's gone through to get to this point. But the introduction to the Kant thesis is, it's kind of almost like a kind of a um, an origin text, you might say, for what becomes Foucault's book, The Order of Things. And even further back, Foucault was teaching a course on philosophical anthropology in the mid-1950s. And there, 
Kant figures quite importantly as a figure who, who talks about anthropology, but of course it goes further back um, to look at earlier texts on by anthropology, Foucault here means the science of man or the human sciences in a sense, the science of the anthropos rather than um, anthropology and perhaps the, the more narrow sense of, of kind of ethology that we might think about it today. So Foucault's interested in the problem of, of the science of, of man in the 50s in the teaching. It goes through into the Kant thesis in, in the early 1960s and then in the order of things in, in 1966, Foucault's examining a number of the human sciences and how they developed out of earlier uh, ways of understanding, and then this critique of the human sciences that he has in the final chapters of that book. So there's a kind of lineage there that sort of runs in parallel in a way to uh, the work around madness. I mean, the, the work around madness is, I guess, the kind of the bridge between the early Foucault and, and then the, the subsequent book that you're going to publish hopefully later, later on this year. And, I mean, it's important that I think we talk about it because it does it runs right the way through the early Foucault and, and almost kind of casts a shadow on um, all, all of the, the discussions. But at the same time, there are almost kind of two versions of it. I guess this book deals with the history of madness as, as almost as, as, a, as a thesis. And then you're going to deal with uh, the reception um, and the idea of it, you know, as a book that was read by Althusser, Derrida, uh, various other, other figures in, in the, the subsequent forthcoming book. So I, I, I wonder... Would it be possible to kind of this, given what we've already said about its length and, and its breadth? But would it be possible to kind of sum up the history of madness in its thesis iteration? Um, towards the end of, of the early Foucault, you talk about you know he, he won prizes for it. The examiners were both sort of, I got the impression they were kind of slightly kind of flabbergasted by almost the kind of the cheek of him. You know the the, the sort of um, the ability and the attempts to, to kind of, you know, do something so bold, but also, you know, they saw the kind of quality and, and the importance. So how, how significant was the history of madness as, as, as a kind of, as a thesis and, you know, what, what sort of impact did it have in, in that context? Right. So I suppose it's worth saying that the version that Foucault defended as a thesis was already a book. And this was one of the conditions of going through the process for the, for the doctoral examination that Congreham had to write a report on it in which he authorised that it could be printed as a book. It was then printed as a book. Foucault got the publisher eventually, uh, and it was published by Plon. And then Foucault defended that book as the thesis in the, the, um, in the Sorbonne in May 61. And I knew that there was a, um, there was a version that had been printed for the thesis defence, and I was, I'd been looking for this, and it was a very, very difficult thing to find because there were only a few copies of this that, that were published. And I eventually found one in an um, antiquarian bookstore in London, and I contacted them and said, you know, would you mind if I had a look at this? And they did actually allow me to look at it for an hour. Um, it is exactly the same as the printed 1961 version, except for the cover says this is a thesis to be defended at the Sorbonne and so on, and these are the, the people on the committee and so on. So the, the thesis version of the History of Madness and the published 1961 edition of the History of Madness are exactly the same in terms of their content. Um, so it's an interesting one because Foucault is defending a, what is basically a book in order to get this, this um, qualification. With the, the Kant... Um, um, secondary thesis that is defended as a as a typescript, um, and it only later the translation part only later gets published. So the history of madness is is an extraordinary book, and, and as much as I worked on this period and tried to trace, you know, what Foucault was doing before and his teaching and his cultural work and various things, it's still the history of madness when it appears is still an astonishing thing. It's such a a, a leap from where Foucault had been before. If you compare it to the publications that he has from the early 1950s, both the ones he published and the ones that are being published um, from the archives, there's still an extraordinary leap in terms of the the shift or the the um, the kind of the, the the level of argument, the level of documentation, the, the the ambition of the project, and the history of madness really sets an agenda for for most of the rest of Foucault's career. There's all sorts of things in that 
initial version of that text. I mean, there's a, a shorter abridged version, which was the one that was first translated into English. Um, and as you said, then only later do we get the full version in English. But in the original long uh, text, Foucault talks about incarceration, he talks about sexuality, he talks about medicine, he talks about ideas around knowledge, all things that come through in, in, in later works from the, the order of things to discipline and punish to the history of sexuality to the birth of the clinic. Foucault's anticipating a number of themes that he's going to work on um, later on in his career. And that that book really is still an astonishing work, that, that it doesn't come from nowhere. And I think what I've tried to do in the early Foucault is to say, well, you know, we can see various things that fed into this in terms of who he was reading, who he was talking to, what he was um, exploring and examining, what he was teaching and so on. But, but nonetheless, when that is, is submitted as a thesis, that, that's still a major step forward in terms of his career. It's always tricky, I guess, with... And you've alluded to this already in terms of the importance of the history of madness, but it's always tricky to, I guess, ask a question about what an intellectual might have been or might have become or might have done. And, for example, that uh, discussion of, you know, whether he might have done you know something more practical in, in medicine, given his work uh, with hospitals and, and, and prisons, but... Um, and this is a kind of classic, you, you know, impossible to answer question. And it's a good example of why people should read the book as, as well, actually. But um, are, there, are there like other Foucaults that might have come from this period? You, you just said then that, you know, the history of madness is, is kind of agenda setting almost right across everything he, he would go on to do. Um, but, you know, are there, is there a Heidegger scholar in there that, that might have um, emerged? You know, is, is there a a writer who would have been really a kind of, you know, an applied psychology lecturer uh, as opposed to um, the kind of intellectual historian and, and I guess, you know, kind of canonical figure that Foucault became. Did, did you detect that in in, in your, your research and, and, and in your kind of understanding of his, his work and life during the period or, or was there a, there a sense, and as you've kind of alluded to, that once the kind of the project of the history of madness was underway and, and, and was published, the kind of, the, the road was was sort of fairly set for it. And that's an interesting question. And I, and I think one of the things that doing this work showed me was was that there were several paths that Foucault could have gone down that he, he chose not to, or that circumstances led him to take a different route. Um, there were ideas that he could carry on that work in, in the more sort of cultural um, attaché kind of thing, apart working with the ambassador, French ambassador to countries running French cultural programs. That was something that seemed to have been seriously suggested to him um, quite early on, particularly with the, the the time he had in Warsaw until the, the Warsaw period ended quite quickly. Um, you, you mentioned Heidegger, and yes, Foucault was reading Heidegger very extensively in the 1950s, and there are serious quantity of notes on this in terms of how actively he was reading it. I mean, notes on texts that are almost as long as the text that they're, they're taking notes on, and that Foucault had access to unpublished materials, which was circulating in kind of almost like Samizdat kind of form, um, where students who had attended Heidegger's lecture courses were, were sharing them around, and there was a sort of a circulation economy. Foucault has notes on Heidegger texts that weren't even published in German until after Foucault's death, for example. Foucault writes the diploma thesis, so an earlier stage of his career in 1949, he writes that again under the supervision of, of Ippolit on Hegel. He does, as we were talking about, the, the Kant work. Foucault writes a long text on phenomenology and psychology, which was published at the end of last year, uh, which starts off talking about psychology and then quite quickly becomes a text on Husserl. And Foucault clearly knew the Husserl material extremely well and spent some time looking at the archive of Husserl's papers. There's a, the main archive of that is in Levin, but there's a copy of the materials at the, the ANS as well. So there's all of these different things of, of Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, Kant. Foucault could have, in a sense, been a much more traditional historian of philosophy had that been a path that he, he, he'd wanted to choose. His teaching, as I said, in the early 1950s when he's teaching in Lille and, and at the NS is in psychology. 
And then when he comes back to France in 1960, he teaches at the University of Clermont-Ferrand. And again, he is teaching psychology within a philosophy department. And that philosophy side is an important part of what he's he's doing. Um, sorry, the psychology side to philosophers is an important part of what he's doing, really until around 1966, when he moves to Tunisia, when he's really the first time teaching philosophy itself. And then, of course, he comes back to France and the, the College de France is not far, far beyond where he is very much teaching in, in a chair that has been designed in his image. So the psychology work, um, he's extremely knowledgeable about that. There is a lot of student notes and a lot of notes from Foucault uh, of his teaching in that, that early 1950s period. Um, but yes, the, the different paths that he could have taken. And the history of madness does seem to be a thing that changes everything for Foucault, that, that once he gets into writing this project, as I said, it, it starts to open up all sorts of possibilities for where he might go beyond that. Uh, he describes the birth of the clinic, for example, as the outtakes from the history of madness. I mean, that's not quite the, the case, but you can see how some elements of that book might have developed from the work that he did around that time. There's a, a promise in the history of madness that, that he's going to write a study on um, the demonic and possession which he never writes a sustained study of that. There's a couple of what look like conference papers that he gives in the 1960s on that theme. But in the archive, there's a text called Chapter One, which talks about precisely these same kind of issues. So that seems to have been a project that Foucault started and then chose for whatever reason not to, to continue. And then when we get into the 1960s, which is the, the topic of the next book, there's all sorts of things that Foucault starts and um, decides not to continue. So he writes a text on philosophical discourse, for example, which he doesn't publish. It, it becomes part of the project that leads to the archaeology of knowledge at the end of that time. So there's all sorts of moments where you you, you sense that Foucault was, was choosing, am I going to go down this path or am I going to go down a different path? And the archives fill in some of that detail, but equally I'm sure that there's a lot of things that he, he decided not to do, and then we have no trace of them, either that he destroyed it or for whatever reason it wasn't kept. So yes, a lot of different possibilities. And, and in a sense, that continues through into the later parts of Foucault's career. Um, the history of sexuality, for example, and, and this is what I talk about in the Foucault's Last Decade book, history of sexuality changes plan quite a few times before it becomes the one that he's working on right at the moment of his death. So there's many times in Foucault's career where, where things could have gone differently. Um, there are also, just, just as maybe as a final point on this, there are also these chance encounters with people that then become really important in terms of, of um, his ideas. And, and you know, had Dumasil not recommended him for this Uppsala post, what would Foucault have done in, in autumn 1955? Would he have stayed teaching in Lille and, and in, in Paris? Would he have gone down a different path had that not been an opportunity for him? So as with many careers, there's a lot of these chance moments. You really kind of brilliantly summed up actually some of the richness um, of the early Foucault actually, and, and you know made it even sort of clearer why it, it's really important to uh, to kind of pick up and, and, and read the book, you know, because there is just so much in there uh, far beyond you know what we've had time to discuss and, and throughout our discussion you've you know sort of mentioned the archaeology of Foucault and, and the next book and I wonder just to conclude whether you could just sort of say very briefly maybe you know the period that's going to cover I know you, you mentioned this at the beginning but also will it will it be this year do you think or, or maybe early 2023 what what's the, the sort of timetable for it, it? it's it, yeah it's going to either be late this year or early 2023 that that's the plan that the Polity and I are working on. Um, it would depend on, on you know the review process and how much extra work I need to do and so on. And and the last couple of years have been really difficult in terms of doing archival work for, for obvious reasons. Um, and so I've been slowed down by by some of those things. I'm I'm having to do some North American work by correspondence rather than actually being able to go to the archives and things. So that's slowed down where I am with this book, and that's why it's a, a bit later than I'd hoped. Um, it covers the period from really the birth of the clinic to the archaeology of knowledge, but there are some things that that slightly kind of go a little bit before that, and and certainly. Uh, into 1970, um, there's some new sources that, that give some clarity about what Foucault was doing 
uh, at Buffalo um, when he was a visiting professor of French there in 1970, which I talk about in the Birth of Power book, but I return to in, in this new book because there's just some availability of material that, that helps to fill in some details there. So I certainly discuss all of Foucault's major books in the 1960s, so Birth of the Clinic, Raymond Roussel, The Order of Things, and The Archaeology of Knowledge. But I also discuss Foucault's work on um, the visual arts, on uh, literature, both in terms of what was published, but also in terms of archival materials. There's two courses on sexuality, which have been published and are also now in English translation, two courses on sexuality from the 1960s, so I discussed those. Uh, I discuss the early version of the book that becomes uh, Les Moelle Shows, The Order of Things. Foucault gives a lecture course on this in 1965 in Brazil, and that that manuscript still exists, so I discuss that. Um, the various draft forms of the archaeology of knowledge. There's a, a, a complete, very early draft of that text. There's fragments of what looked to be an intermediate draft. There's, as I mentioned, this manuscript on philosophical discourse, which looks to have been a sort of side project that then gets dropped in favour of this. And there's a whole range of other uh, materials, whether they're his reading notes, so we can see how he got to some of the ideas he did, the teaching uh, materials that still exist. So there's a whole course on Nietzsche, for example, from 1969, 1970, uh, and various other um, traces and sources. So I try and reconstruct that period and that when that book is out, people would be able, if they wanted, to read from the early Foucault to the archaeology of Foucault to Foucault, the birth of power, through to Foucault's last decade. And as we, we started with a discussion of why I've written these books almost in reverse order, but if people wanted, they could very soon, they could read these books in, in sequence chronologically. And, and I hope that this, this um, the archaeology of Foucault on the 1960s fills that gap and kind of completes the series. So it's, a, it's an interesting book to, to be working on and be in the final stages of, because I don't feel I'm just completing a single book. I feel that I'm completing this four-part study of Foucault. Um, which has its you know, benefits, but also its downsides. Is I feel I'm letting go of a very big project.